want you in the lowest level of your home. That is going to be an observed tornado, confirmed tornado. And sure enough, there it is. There's the rotation. Trees are down. in the lowest level of your home. That is going to be an observed tornado, confirmed tornado. And sure enough, there it is. There's the rotation. Trees are down, power lines are down, there's debris along streets. Severe, devastating storms, tearing apart communities and lives in a matter of seconds. Everybody is living through horror right now. That is one ugly hurricane. There's so many dimensions to hurricane climate problem. I'm just in shock complete shock across every region of the country and across every season experts say our weather is changing it really depends on what we decide to do as a society fire surged through here so fast early this morning this is going to be something that is more frequent going into the future over the next hour we're exploring the weather the trends are we seeing a forest die everywhere you see a color go from a cooler to a warmer lots of trees have died and the impact on you. A flash flood emergency is up. There are houses that are underwater, two or three or four feet. It's heartbreaking. I don't think you can ever be prepared for something like this. Now, a special presentation, forecasting our future. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mike Lyons. We see and feel the impact of weather every day, from the simple things like what to wear to the more critical moments when severe weather strikes our community stronger hurricanes, stubborn wildfires, and what seems like more frequent flooding in many places have some of us asking, is the threat and impact from our weather growing? That question led us to forecasting our future, an initiative this year at WPBF 25 and all our Hearst television stations across the country. The goal is to take a deeper look at how local weather is impacting us by analyzing facts and data to understand any changing weather patterns. One thing scientists largely agree on, the Earth's climate is experiencing changes. This data shows how much global temperatures the past 140 years have been above or below a recognized average. Many scientists say if it feels like your local weather is changing, this may be a primary cause. We're getting help this hour from our chief meteorologists right here and their teams as we explore weather's impact. In all, more than 100 weather experts from the Northeast and Southwest to the Central U.S. and West Coast working every day to keep us informed and safe. We begin with a look at the most severe weather from chief meteorologist Jay Cardosi at WLKY in Kentucky. Got a tornado developing right on top of us. Wow. Wow. Just got the confirmation. Made landfall as a cat four. The wind's 155 miles per hour, and this is devastating. I've never seen anything like this. There was a large building right where you're looking. Tornadoes and hurricanes, two of the most violent, most damaging storms we experience. In a matter of minutes, they destroy lives, demolish homes, and scar the landscape. Scenes repeated year after year. We actually barricade ourselves in the bathroom downstairs. I just remember screaming and my child screaming too. In December, a series of tornadoes tore through four states in the central U.S., killing 76 people. Kentucky took the brunt of the punch. The outbreak was unusual because tornadoes don't typically strike here on the verge of winter. It is upsetting. I know what's happening. Four months earlier, Ida, a strong history-making Category 4 hurricane unleashed on Louisiana with relentless 150 mile an hour winds. I've never seen nothing like it. There's no comparison, really. Ida was just one hurricane in a memorable season, says Chief Meteorologist Margaret Orr of WDSU in New Orleans. 21 named storms, seven became hurricanes, four became major hurricanes. Hurricane season 2021 was an active season, the third most active in history. The hurricane activity has increased dramatically 
since 1995. We're in this period of above average hurricane activity. Mike Lyons, chief meteorologist at WPBF in Florida, has been forecasting weather more than 30 years, including when Hurricane Andrew tore through South Florida in 1992, one of only four Category 5 hurricanes to ever make landfall in the U.S. Winds of 160 miles per hour, but for the most part, you could describe it as a 20 mile wide tornado. I mean, that's pretty much what it was. There was very little rain, it was just all wind, and it just produced catastrophic damage. The strength and frequency of hurricanes are the subject of frequent research. The results of if changes could be happening and why varies. One MIT study last year concluded North Atlantic hurricanes have become more frequent over 150 years and more powerful when they reach land. A study from NOAA found hurricanes have become stronger more recently, but the overall count isn't really changing. So we have a lot of data, but we have to be careful uh, in the way that we analyze it. Scientist Tom Knudsen studies hurricanes and climate at NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. He says, if you take into account all the available global data going back to about 1900, there is not enough strong evidence of overall higher hurricane frequency. If you look at the data for a shorter period of time in the Atlantic, you do see a difference. Since the 1980s or so, we've had more hurricanes, more major hurricanes. Intensities have gone up. Rapid intensification has been increasing. Knutson cautions that looking at only a 40-year period with something as complex as hurricanes could be misleading. Plus, hurricanes and weather occurrences are subject to natural variability. But Knutson says rising sea levels and increased warmth and moisture in the atmosphere all documented in scientific data, may eventually impact hurricanes in some ways. So we are projecting that going forward through the 21st century, uh, the rainfall rates out of hurricanes uh, we're expecting is going to increase. That's where the tornado is, moving at 55 miles per hour. Moisture and warmth are also key ingredients in tornadoes, along with wind shear. Conditions that come together more often in the eastern half of the U.S. than any other place on Earth. Tornadoes are there because we have a bunch of instability that just builds up in the atmosphere, and we need to get rid of that instability somehow. Damon Lane, our chief meteorologist at KOCO in Oklahoma, says tornadoes are the destructive result of the atmosphere calming itself. The rebuilding process is still going on a decade after. He took us on a tour of Moore, Oklahoma. Everyone has a story to tell that day. Where a mile-wide tornado with winds in excess of 200 miles an hour twisted its way through town on May 20th, 2013. Two dozen people were killed, including seven children at Plaza Towers Elementary School. You can never prepare for a big natural disaster that's gonna come in and it's gonna affect your life. It is heartbreaking. My jaw dropped as we drove into town. Seeing that kind of damage has been something that I have not seen, honestly, since 2005 with Hurricane Katrina. Meteorologist Allison Rogers at our station WLWT in Cincinnati was on the ground reporting from the tornado aftermath in Kentucky four months ago. She says data shows there is some variability right now with tornadoes. We have seen a shift in where these tornadoes are becoming more and more prevalent. There has been an increase in the number of tornadoes over the Mid-South region, so think Memphis and the surrounding areas, and a decrease over southern Texas, western Texas, up through the western Kansas. Dr. Harold Brooks, senior research scientist at NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory, says while the Mid-South region is seeing a more recent increase in activity, the area has always been prone to tornadoes. But the storm cycle and patterns didn't attract as much attention as the Central Plains, often referred to as Tornado Alley. Nationally, the total number of tornadoes hasn't changed in the last 70 years. We also have no evidence that tornadoes have gotten stronger or, or weaker. We have seen in the last 40 years has been a large increase in the, bulk, in the variability of tornado occurrence. We have fewer days now in the United States per year that have a tornado, but we have more days that have a lot of tornadoes occurring on them. We got a tornado right here. Right there, just to the south of the TV station. It does look like this is a tornado on the ground. One of our big challenges is actually trying to explain why the variability is increased. For both tornadoes and hurricanes, experts say technology and time are what will eventually help provide more concrete answers 
about how the global climate could be affecting our regional and local weather events. As we go further in time, have another decade or two of data, we should begin to refine our view on some of these uh, issues where we're still sort of scratching our heads. We're gonna be doing some um, really good work towards trying to provide in more information or better information in a way that helps people make better decisions. Everywhere you look, you can see the strength, the power of this tornado. For now, the most important thing is to be as prepared as possible for the impact that weather will continue to have no matter where we live. That was my home, but God's got better things for me. I'm alive, I survived that, and I'm here. How can you prepare for severe weather? Download our free WPBF 25 app so you can get the warnings for your area. Now, when you get an alert or told to head to a safe place or leave an area, follow that advice. Severe weather can happen anywhere, anytime, even if you're not in an area prone to hurricanes and tornadoes, from searing heat to storms that can pack a punch. Meteorologist Ava Marie at WBAL in Baltimore, Maryland, looks at how typical weather is changing and becoming less typical. The roof of this home has been blown off, half of it falling onto this white truck. We still get some very, very strong gusts from time to time like this one. A flash flood emergency is up still for about another half hour. The whole downtown area, business area is underwater. Damaging floods, yeah. powerful thunderstorms, relentless wind, and snow that just keeps piling up. These are the most common ways many of us feel the impact of weather. In the Northeast, blizzards and nor'easters are seasonal staples. You can't see a thing. Very dangerous to be out here this morning. In 78, when we had the big blizzard, the car like this was completely buried. In the mountains of North Carolina, a few inches of snow isn't uncommon, and it's somewhat welcomed. We haven't gotten a good snow in a couple years, so it's good to see this. I don't normally enjoy snow, but hey, it's good to see at least one good one a year. It only takes one storm to cause serious problems. Basically, all of eastern New Mexico was shut down, and there was the first time I've ever seen, I haven't seen it since, the state issued a civil emergency. KOAT Chief Meteorologist Joe Diaz will never forget what unfolded a couple of days after Christmas 2015 in an area of New Mexico that's home to highly traveled Interstate 40. 60 to 80 mile per hour winds kicked in. We had blizzard warnings in effect. We were warning people that there could be six to 10 foot snow drifts and indeed that did happen. In Roswell, more than a foot of snow, a new all time daily record. More snow in one day than the area normally sees during an entire winter. Our weather and our climate is variable. The reality is no region of the country is immune to stretches of abnormally warm, cold, rainy, snowy, or stormy conditions. I can't say that I've ever seen uh, such localized and specific damage, but also such widespread damage. Wind is a leading cause of damage from storms. And scientists say there's another dangerous, often underrated element, lightning. Unlike a storm itself, exactly where lightning will hit is difficult to predict. A group that tracks lightning says there were 194 million strikes in the United States alone last year, and the most are actually typically seen in two states, Texas and in Florida. All of a sudden it started getting windy outside and there it was. The rain was going in circles. In southern Pennsylvania, data from weather records indicates the chance of seeing more rain and heavier rain is growing, especially in the spring. WGAL meteorologist Ethan Houston explains. We are seeing an upward shift in precipitation. From 1981 to 2010, our average spring precipitation was 10.26 inches of rain. Our new normal is now 11.08 inches. That's an increase of just under 8%. In fact, all of our seasons are seeing an increase. Annual precipitation is also on the rise in western Pennsylvania. I was like, we have like 15 minutes to get out, and we did. So I'm just lucky that we got out safe. The greater Pittsburgh area, with all its rivers and aging locks and dams, is experiencing record amounts of flooding. The flood season was typically between December through the end of April. But we've now seen in the last five or six years, we've seen flooding in June, we've seen flooding in July. A lot of these homes, they build up like three or four steps 
way back because of the flooding situation here. And flooding from intense rain, snow melt, storm surge, and overflowing rivers and streams impacts more people in the U.S. than any other weather event. It's responsible for 90% of disaster-related property damage, according to FEMA, with many communities hit repeatedly, forcing families and business owners to repair and rebuild over and over again. Unbelievable. And there's nothing you can do, just stand and watch. You probably heard this one about flooding before. Turn around, don't drown. If you come across a flooded roadway, do not try to drive through it. You never know the condition or stability of what's beneath the water. We sometimes don't notice the effects of heat on our bodies. Fighting Florida's blazing sun, the emergency system being created for heat waves, plus. We could see four to 10 more degrees by the end of the century. The first job in the world to fight the sun and later. I'm Jeff Rawson. We have three sustainable products that will help you help the environment, including this thing, which is also going to save you some money. And we encourage you to download our free streaming app, Very Local. It's available on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can stream our latest weather forecasts anytime or catch our latest local newscasts. You'll also find this program on demand very soon, along with incredible original programming for just about everyone from food lovers to people looking for their next adventure. Now to our rising temperatures and how we can defend ourselves. Experts believe major heat waves are becoming more common and future ones will be longer and more extreme. Blistering temperatures are taking a deadly toll. Heat kills more people each year than hurricanes, tornadoes and flooding combined. It's the number one weather related killer in the United States. This is the uh, National Digital Forecast Database. We sometimes don't notice the effects of heat on our bodies until, until it's too late. And it's getting hotter here in South Florida too. Temperatures are higher, humidity more intense, but the biggest impact of our escalating temperatures happens at night. When the sun goes down, the temperatures stay up. The nighttime temperatures appear to be increasing faster than the daytime temperatures. At night, we're not cooling off as much as we used to. So you know, we're, not, we're not getting as much relief from those hot daytime temperatures. So we got the city of Miami here, we got Fort Lauderdale here, and then we pan up here, there we got Palm Beach County right here, we got Lake Okeechobee. Those warm nights and very hot days mean more work for forecasters at the National Weather Service in Miami. 63% and then right. less down here. Yeah. Meteorologists are issuing more heat advisories as the heat index, a combination of temperatures and humidity, rises to 105 degrees. Unfortunately, these critical warnings are often ignored by South Floridians because high heat it's a way of life around here. The storm is just crawling right now, five miles per hour. A hurricane warning, on the other hand, gets everyone's attention. Now, a group in Washington wants to create a heat wave ranking system like the one used for hurricanes. So when you have a hurricane bearing down uh, in your neighborhood and you find out it's a category one, the way, you, the way people would prepare for that and the way the authorities would prepare for that may look a lot different than if it's a Category 5 uh, hurricane. Unlike the hurricane scale, this proposed system would categorize heat waves based on projected health outcomes. In most years, intense heat claims more lives than hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods combined. And I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that. It just gives people, I think, a little bit better sense of hey, what, what, this could be dangerous for me. What can I do to protect myself and my family uh, in a way that we, we don't get with just a weather-based warning system? The team is working on three heat wave categories, and each one would initiate a series of protocols to protect the public. For instance, a category one would indicate a low number of potential deaths. Now, Miami-Dade County is one of six locations where the program I talked about will be tested this summer. Meteorologist Sandra Shaw has more on how South Florida is taking a global lead targeting temperatures. It's hot as hell. 
That's how it's here, just like being in here. I wish I wasn't out here in it, but I ain't got no other choice. We have over 300,000 outdoor workers here in Miami-Dade County, and they are up to 35 times more likely to have a heat-related illness. Jane Gilbert is Miami-Dade's chief heat officer. It's the first position in the world. Heat and concerns around displacement, climate gentrification, were the top two concerns in our more uh, lower income communities. This is an urban heat island, an area where there's more concrete and asphalt than there is tree canopy or greenery. And so the temperatures here in these areas are five to 10 degrees hotter than elsewhere. Like steamy hot, like, like uh, to the fact that when you come outdoors, you will not want to have on any clothes, that type of hot. Right across the street from Cherry Thompson's neighborhood, new trees are going up at Gwen Cherry Park on Northwest 22nd Avenue. We've had native species planted throughout this park as a result of a donation. It's part of our Million Trees Miami initiative. Gilbert coordinates projects on cooling, education, and infrastructure. We not only have the health impacts of extreme heat, but the costs. We have increasing utility costs and the majority of our population here is already cost burden when it comes to housing. For her three-year plan, she compiled a 15-member task force. It includes things like cooling resiliency centers equipped with water and chargers in case of a blackout. They also plan to train citizens to deliver first aid. We could see four to ten more degrees by the end of the century in 80 years. That combined with the urbanization, we're growing, continuing to grow rapidly, could uh, result in well over three months of high danger heat indexes of 105 or more. Now following Miami's lead, Phoenix, Arizona just appointed a chief heat officer and officials in Los Angeles just voted to assign someone that role too. Internationally, Sierra Leone and Athens, Greece are now assigning heat officers. Are these some of the corals that we're talking about here? There's more reef out there to treat. Fighting to save the beating heart of the ocean, the groundbreaking underwater project involving an everyday remedy that we use when we're sick. Florida's coral reef stretches more than 350 miles from the dry Tortugas to the St. Lucie Inlet. Millions of plants and animals rely on it. Meteorologist Glenn Glazer investigates the extreme efforts going on right now to save the only coral reef system in the United States. My children are native-born Floridians. And from the first time their little feet touched the sand... That was a long crawl the ocean began calling. But while life is thriving above the waves, below, it's dying. If I look down you know, on a reef, kind of like I'm an airplane, from an airplane, and I ask how much of that reef is coral, um, it's now below 5% at most locations. Are these some of the corals that we're talking about here? Sure, so um, you know, these are all skeletons of corals. Okay. Um, so corals are the really interesting organism where they have a they build a calcium carbonate skeleton underneath this living veneer of tissue that's a combination of the coral animal and the algae that live inside it. This skeleton not only provides habitat for millions and millions of fishes, it also protects all of our homes here on the Treasure Coast. So when storms come, these corals dissipate that wave energy and help to protect our shorelines. Recently, something has changed, and it has Dr. Josh Voss and his team scrambling to take action. What is killing the coral out there? Why, why, is this, why do you need to do this? So the biggest issue lately has been a new coral disease outbreak that we call stony coral tissue loss disease. Okay. What's different about this one is that it seems to infect a much broader range of coral species and it seems to just be relentless. John Hunt, a scientist for Florida Fish and Wildlife, along with Dr. Voss, is working to help save the reefs through outplanting. Is that like taking a potted plant and putting it out in the forest and putting it in the soil and hoping that it'll grow there? Is that, is that kind of the same thing? So think of this as a tree nursery where you have, in this case, many hundreds of thousands of corals. And when they grow up enough in the nursery, then we remove them from the nursery and put them out on the reef. We believe that it's the, the largest coral outplanting experiment to date. 
um, and we're hoping to determine essentially whether or not this restoration can be successful in the face of the diseases that we're seeing out on the reef right now. How big is this entire coral piece? Probably the most groundbreaking experiment is an idea that came from one of Dr. Voss's students. One of my grad students, Erin Schilling. This is the outline of where we actually swam with the camera. Her main thesis project was to assess whether or not we could use amoxicillin or chlorinated epoxy to treat these corals. Yes, scientists and students are applying a human antibiotic, and it's working. We pack the syringes on deck and then apply it to the coral underwater. The, the challenge is that, like, by design, it's sticky. Oh. Right? We want it to stay attached to the colony. Dr. Voss and his team headed 70 miles west of Key West to the Dry Tortugas National Park, and there they got to work. Each of us was averaging about four dives a day. Um, and so we would treat, you know, o over that time period, we treated a, a total of just over 6,000 colonies. Um, but even that was only over you know, roughly three kilometer stretch of reef. So um, it was a great success and accomplishment, but there's more reef out there to treat. To make sure the treatment continues working, scientists are using newly invented 3D imaging. So we were able to see over time by filming these models like once a month for almost a year um, that the individual corals kept a lot more healthy tissue when they were treated with this. Dr. Voss and his FAU Harbor Branch team, along with Florida Fish and Wildlife, will continue their research. But there are simple things we can do. We can all help by practicing the best possible environmental behavior that we can. We need to be mindful about water quality and, and support policies both at the local and state level that are uh, going to improve our local waterways so that corals will benefit from that as well. After all, by helping our coral reefs, we're not only helping those that live in the ocean, but also those who live on land. And that's a forecast for a better future for all of us. Western wildfires causing concerns in states across the country the trouble they can create hundreds of miles away. And coming up later. I was petrified of thunderstorms. I hated thunder because it was so loud. It actually gave me a true appreciation for the power of Mother Nature. We have a passion for protecting people no matter where they live. Putting the spotlight on some of our meteorologists, how they became so interested in weather and the storms and events that left a lasting impact on them. Wildfires may be most visible on the west coast of the United States, but each year they're burning in different sizes and severity in every state. And while the overall numbers of wildfires fluctuates, you can see here the number of acres burned across the U.S. has been steadily growing over nearly four decades. And the mark these fires leave go far beyond the property and their paths. KCRA meteorologist Heather Waldman brings us the story from Sacramento. We begin with breaking news. You can see that explosion of flames there and smoke just in the past hours. As a fire continues to burn here where we are along String Canyon Road. Wildfire season typically occurs between May and October in the western U.S. It's probably going to be a really ugly situation, but oh, I got my dogs. Yeah. I got me. Yeah. We're good. But the season is shifting and it's expected to get worse. January 21st, 2022. A fire burned near Big Sur, prompting evacuations and closing a section of Highway 1. Crews say this fire, at this time of the year, is a wake-up call. The fact that it's January and we're talking about Big Sur, an area in Monterey County that's supposed to be the area that gets the most rain during the winter months, and we're having a fire that's more than a thousand acres, that's an issue and a cause for concern. Historically, the largest fires have burned during the summer months. But weather is getting warmer and it's getting drier. This is going to be something that is more frequent going into the future. Um, as far as the uh, what we in the past considered an off season fire, uh, you know, fires that happened you know, essentially between December and let's say March. Here are the three biggest weather factors that affect fire season heat, drought, 
and wind. This January wildfire proves that strong wind and low humidity were still able to dry the area out despite all of the rain that we saw in December. Last year, more than 8,500 wildfires burned over two and a half million acres in the United States. So far this year, fires have burned more than 800,000 acres. That's already above the 10 year average. Western fires can also have devastating consequences to our health, even reaching as far as the East Coast. Last summer, the jet stream carried smoke from California wildfires thousands of miles, lingering over much of the Mid-Atlantic. As wildfires continue to rage in a number of states out west, people on the East Coast, including the greater Baltimore area, are starting to see the effects in the form of smoke in the upper levels of the atmosphere. Time-lapse video shows the plume blanketing the city, enough to be seen by satellite covering New England, triggering an air quality alert bad enough to create unhealthy conditions. Environmental health expert Amir Sapkota says scientists are racing to understand the impact wildfires can have on human health. How are we going to adapt to this new set of hazards as a society? And this is where a lot of work is uh, coming in now in terms of trying to develop an uh, early warning system that allows us to anticipate these hazards. People living thousands of miles from West Coast fires can suffer from fine particles in the eyes, nose, and lungs. Increases risk of hospitalization for asthma, increases heart attacks, uh, but also increases risk of preterm birth among uh, pregnant women. Many wildfires in the U.S. are started by people. With climate changes creating more volatile settings for fires and wildfire season becoming longer, it seems almost any fire can grow into a life-changing disaster. You know, as long as we're safe, that's the priority and, you know, everything else can be replaced. 2017 was the costliest year on record in the United States for property damage from wildfires, almost $24 billion. The single most expensive fire came one year later in 2018. That's the Camp Fire in California, which racked up more than $10 billion in losses. For many people, the most common interaction with the science of weather comes through the meteorologists on their favorite TV stations. We want to introduce you to more of our weather experts and find out about the weather events that left a lasting impact on them. We have storm teammate coverage across storm Central Watch Island. 9 weather. We got a brand new severe thunderstorm morning now. Winds up to 120 miles per hour. My inspiration that. for becoming a meteorologist were two storms that happened in 1991 in my hometown. Hurricane Bob followed by the perfect storm. The coastal flooding just left a lasting impression and I was amazed by the power of Mother Nature. So here's that system building in from the south and west. The great blizzard of 78 had a major impact on southern New England and even southern New Hampshire. And I was in elementary school. Imagine that as a kid being out of school for a week due to a snowstorm. What would happen? Well, the next storm would approach and I'd be curious. This is a large and extremely dangerous tornado. Look at how wide oh, this is. tornado is. You can see it plain, Fear. You can plainly see it now. I was Gosh. petrified of thunderstorms. I hated thunder because it was so loud. Checked out some books, found out it was only a noise, and from then I've been hooked. Because this looks pretty significant on radar. The we biggest have event that I've had to cover and my team has covered was back on December 15th, 2021. That derecho packed winds of 60 to 90 miles per hour across most of the state, and there were over 60 tornadoes that touched down over the course of the afternoon and evening. That was the most tornadoes Iowa has ever recorded during a single day. I think a lot of people kind of scratching their heads and asking the questions, are we seeing changes? Is our weather becoming more extreme? Incredible. I remember on St. Patrick's Day of 2019 being in Pacific Junction when the water started coming over the railroad tracks there. A few minutes later, we heard the sirens blaring around town that they were saying, get out, evacuate, the water's coming over. So we got out, seeing the devastation of it. It had tremendous impacts to so many people in so many communities that we're still seeing those impacts today. One day that I honestly will never forget is the day that we got about a foot of rain in a little over a 12 hour period. Storm after storm, shower after shower, moving into Benton County. And that amount of rain in that short amount of time led to extraordinary flash flooding on a scale that at least parts of Northwest Arkansas hadn't seen in modern times. We had two children who died on this day 
in the flood waters. And that in particular, the two kids will never probably leave me. The winds are definitely over hurricane force. Tornado on the ground, tornado on the ground. This was a lady who lived in Oak Grove. She came up to me at a grocery store and said that I saved her life. But she quoted me and said, you may have ignored a tornado warning from me before. Oak Grove, if you are in Oak Grove, this is one you should not ignore. And she said she went to the basement. 45 seconds later, her house was gone. She tells me that because she's still alive, she gets to hang out with her grandkids and that she is still around. Personal responsibility is a big part of staying safe during severe weather. We're there, we're putting the information out, but you have to have a way to get that information. So whether you have a weather radio, you receive alerts on your phone, you have to have some way to get the weather information and then find a way to act on it. A lot of moderate to heavy rain just off to our south. I think the biggest challenge that has actually increased between say the year 2000 to the present time is that the demand for hour by hour forecasts and for even higher accuracy has only increased. We all know that weather is the single most important thing for people every day. So when you are there for a community, you make that connection. People can relate to you. And once you make that connection, you'll never lose it. A lot of lightning now headed towards that this thing is still on the ground. You can see all of the effects of that strong cold front. All meteorologists, we have a passion for protecting people. No matter where they live, that's what we're about getting the right information out as quickly as we possibly can. And for me, there is no greater calling than helping people maneuver what can be truly deadly situations. Every 10 years, the U.S. does a census about our growing population. But what about one involving trees? What do these trees tell us about our changing climate? we're taking you inside America's forest census. Repurposing restaurant oyster shells and unlocking the secrets of weather resistant crops. See the unique things happening all around us aimed at chipping away at our changing climate. You're using products right now that hurt the environment and by the way, they cost you more. We have replacement products like this thing to show you. It's gonna save you some money next. And if you don't already have it, be sure to download our smartphone app. It's a great way to stay informed of weather in our community. Get severe weather alerts as they happen from our weather team right on your phone. Right now, the drought situation is growing worse across the country, especially in western states. Now, that contributes to all sorts of problems from more volatile fire conditions, crop damages for farmers, and land erosion. The U.S. Drought Monitor shows 35 states are currently experiencing moderate drought or worse. Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert shows us how forests, a unique laboratory and technology, are all combining to give a forecast of what's to come. Take a step into the future by going back to the past. Straight between. Yeah, your center. Measurement by measurement, from below. 20? And above. These researchers are on the vanguard of tracking how a changing climate, from intensifying drought to hotter temperatures to more ferocious wildfires, is affecting a crucial part of Earth's ecosystem. We're going to have to measure low on that. You're watching the nation's forest census. Just like the once a decade census goes door to door, the forest census goes trunk to trunk and bark to bark measuring a portion of trees on 171,000 plots across the country. And they've been doing it for nearly a century. We want to get an age, so we're going to try to drill and hit the center of the pith. See how there's, it's glowing, all that sap is in there. There could be a disease or something in there. The National Investigative Unit went with a forest inventory crew deep into the Cibola National Forest in the northwest corner of New Mexico to watch something rarely seen by the public. When I look at a forest like this and I see all this green, it's hard to imagine that drought is impacting 
these forests, is it? It is. John Shaw leads forest census analysis for part of the western U.S. Do tree rings help you improve the quality of your forecast? Absolutely. Trees will tend to show signs of slowing down uh, before we see them die off. Look at how narrow that ring is. Could have been a drought year. It could have been a drought year. Margaret Evans showed us how to read tree rings inside the world's oldest laboratory of tree ring research at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Evans and her colleague Kelly Heilman are using their research for the first time to help the Forest Service predict how a changing climate is affecting our forests. What did you find? We found up to about a 91% decrease in average tree growth each year. That sounds dramatic. Yes, uh, very dramatic. The worst case scenario of what we were forecasting. Did you feel a punch in your gut when you crunched the data and found that? This type of work can be a little bit disheartening, um, but the uplifting thing is that we can use these models that we've developed to identify management strategies that can help us promote resilience in these forests. We need to do something about it right now. We really are running out of time to get something done. And that plan and warning for the future. What happens when it's dry, what happens when it's very dry. Is what John Shaw from the Forest Service is now working on with its forest vegetation simulator. Literally, you've seen it the first time this is tried. Using the tree measurements right of the past and climate changes in the present to now go decade by decade into a potential version of the future, as seen in this exclusive simulation for this story. Are we seeing a forest die? Everywhere you see a color go from a cooler to a warmer, lots of trees have died. We are using the tree rings tying to the climate models and then projecting that forward and say, well, we see this change in growth when it's this hot, this hot, dry, or this wet and cool. So the tree ring data is giving you more information so that your projections are more realistic. Exactly, yeah, and, and that's the goal. A goal to track and predict the intensifying climate changes now preying on America's forests. In the Cibola National Forest in New Mexico, I'm Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert. Now let's talk about one way you and your family can have their own impact on the weather and climate of the future. Chief National Consumer Correspondent Jeff Rawson tells us it's, it's as simple as choosing smarter products that can help the environment. Swapping a product you use every day for another product doesn't just help the environment, it could also save you big money. So you know me, I'm on the hunt looking for the best eco-friendly products that'll take something off your weekly shopping list and save you some money. Let's go. First up, dryer sheets. Environmentalists say chemicals used to make them get released from the heat of the dryer. Those chemicals pollute the air we're breathing. But they're also wasting your money. Let me explain why. So I have a big family. We do a lot of, a lot of laundry around here. And look, we use these dryer sheets, okay? These dryer sheets like this. You probably do too. But here's the thing. After one use, they're done. Poof, goodbye. You get to use it once. So why not switch to these, right? These are wool dryer balls. Yeah, they're made of wool. You can probably see. It's kind of cool. You throw these in. It increases the airflow and makes your clothes soft without any of the chemicals. Better for the environment and better for your wallet too, because guess what? These wool dryer balls cut down drying time by 20 to 30%. They dry your clothes faster, they absorb the water. And here's the other thing. This six pack cost me 18 bucks, sounds expensive, but you can use these for up to a thousand loads of laundry. Load it in, forget about it. Another big pollutant, makeup wipes. Millions of them are tossed into landfills every day, and it takes 100 years for them to break down. My producer Kelly found a better solution. It's called the makeup eraser. Okay, you're probably like me. I use about two of these wipes a day, and these are these ones that you just throw away. It's one done. But guess what? You can be using this. It's a reusable makeup towel. It cost me about 20 bucks, but guess what? You can use it over 36 hundred times and then toss it into the washer and you're done. And it's that easy. Look at that. Finally, one of the worst pollutants, plastic wrap. We go through 53 million rolls of it a year. That's enough plastic film to shrink wrap the state of Texas. So here's an alternative. It's something called reusable beeswax food wrap. Yeah, it's made out of beeswax 
and it's reusable for up to a year. We bought this for just 28 bucks. It's a pack of six of them. Two cups of sugar right here. Let me put some plastic wrap on this just to show you what's a side-by-side -side comparison, okay? Hold it from the top and you can see that the plastic wrap is holding the sugar inside the cup. But will the beeswax work as well? Moment of truth. Yes, the beeswax works as well, holding the sugar in the cup. It's cheaper for you all year and it's better for the environment. We're gonna put a link to all these products and more money-saving eco products on my website right now, rossonreports.com. Some great ideas from Jeff to try around your home, and we found some other unique initiatives aimed at easing the burden on the environment. It is huge. It's, it covers hundreds of square miles. And it's entirely underground, what you're not seeing that can help with droughts. Plus, repurpose oyster shells, a twist on lawn equipment, and a teenager leading a charge for change. It's all up next. Several states and the federal government are focusing on how to get ahead of the changes with our environment and the fallout from severe weather. A United Nations climate panel recently said it's, quote, now or never to get a handle on warming and the damaging results. Chief Meteorologist Jeremy Nelson at WJCL in Georgia shows us how some are pitching in right now. The simple beauty of the ocean and shoreline attracts people to the communities dotting Maine's coast. But a rising sea and eroding land are a constant and growing threat. This stuff, when it gets exposed like this, can be really, really unstable. To reduce erosion, the state is now testing a possible natural solution, a living shoreline built with oyster shells collected from local restaurants, bundled in coconut fiber bags, and anchored with logs. They're 10 to 12 inches in diameter. So what they're meant to do is to try to break up the currents and also break up ice. It's one example of the innovative work underway to reduce the devastating impact of severe weather and a change in environment. In Sacramento, California, where a water shortage is often the problem, a different kind of solution, a water bank that's underground. It is huge, it's, it covers hundreds of square miles. During wet periods, when surface water is in good supply, water providers will rely on drawing more from lakes and rivers, and excess water can be pumped into the natural ground storage. It basically is, is a giant sponge made of soil and sands and gravel in the ground. During dry periods, providers draw from the water bank to help supply homes and businesses. Changing weather also puts a growing burden on farming, but research underway in Nebraska is aimed at giving farmers the upper hand. Making the season longer, making possible for growing for more days. Biochemist Kasia Gavatska is investigating why this perennial grass, a cousin of corn, is resistant to cold snaps. She's discovered some grasses have an early warning mechanism to help them brace for cold temperatures and lower light. If that natural process can be crossbred to other grasses and crops, it could be a game changer. We can create better crops which are having this insurance policy. Science and simple ingenuity may be helping us slowly adapt to and prepare for the changing impact of our weather. On a larger scale, scientists say reducing greenhouse gas emissions are necessary. Changes at home in communities across the country can add up. In Louisville, Kentucky, a lawn care for cleaner air program gives rebates for the purchase of electric powered lawn care equipment to replace old gas-powered gear, therefore reducing pollutants. At Marquette University in Wisconsin, the police department is helping cut emissions by moving to a hybrid fleet. These vehicles tend to be used a lot. They're, they're pretty much running 24-7. Engine runtime with the hybrids, about 70% less than all gas vehicles. It's our little part that we can do. In Malden, South Carolina, an education center built entirely by renewable energy sources, but the purpose here is much bigger. This solar-powered center teaches sustainability to the next generation. Kids are our future. 
Well, if they don't understand sustainability, you can't affect change. The future, it seems, is in good hands. I wanted to be part of the solution. At only 14 years old, Lillian Hill is making a difference. You'll often find her at the Iowa State House, leading adults and leading the charge to get lawmakers to pass legislation for clean energy. And that will help ensure a brighter tomorrow. I want my little brothers to be able to get out of high school and still have a future worth fighting for. Every little bit can make a difference. If you want to learn more about any of the initiatives we just mentioned, we posted story links about each one of them in the Forecasting Our Future section on our website and our app. And while you're there, take another look at any of the stories you saw in this program. You can also check out our interactive charts detailing trends with global temperatures and expected changes with sea levels, agriculture, and more. And we have the results of an exclusive survey from our National Investigative Unit about how local communities are responding to severe and changing weather. We hope this program brought more awareness of how changing trends in weather are impacting local communities all across the country. You'll see more forecasting our future coverage right here throughout the year. Thank you for watching.